I'm Patrick Sang, Global Citizen, Investor. Join me as I talk with global influencers for their insight, wisdom, and how they overcame their own personal challenges. Sharing positivity, overcoming challenges, creating one world together. I'm Patrick Sang, anything is possible. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Anything Is Possible. I have a very special guest from LA, Hollywood, Hollywood uh, royalty, entertainer, producer, author, mother, Melissa. Welcome to the show. Thank you, so excited to be here. Yes, thank you for um, your time and uh, we're very humble. We don't have enough time to ask all the juicy details. That's okay, you can um, just, you know, my life is a little bit out there. You've grown up in an entertainment family. Did you sort of like fall into the industry because of the family or is it something that you, you wanted to get into? My parents actively tr made sure that my childhood was very traditional because the world that they worked in was so crazy. We would sit down to dinner every night. We would do all those kinds of things. And one of the things that they did was their offices, their main offices were in our house. They converted the garage. So I grew up around it just because my parents wanted to be there. That being said, I went to college and I decided this is not what I'm gonna do. And taking a huge leap from entertainment, everybody always laughs about this, I decided I was gonna go into advertising because that's so different, right? Um, and then by the end of my freshman year, I was like, what am I doing? This is what I know. This is my sweet spot, this is where I'm comfortable. And I told my parents that's what I wanted to do and they were supportive but not encouraging. So would you say that you were rebellious to pick advertising when entertainment was really in your DNA? Um, if my parents could say that was the most rebellious thing I did, they would have been really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother was the late Joan Rivers, Hollywood legend. Growing up in a very famous family, how do you deal with that in terms of like the pressure? I've gotten to a place in my life where I really don't feel it as pressure. I have to take the good with the bad. And the hardest part is getting credit for what I have done and what I have accomplished. And my mother always said one of her biggest frustrations was that I do not get the credit and she gets the credit that she felt I should deserve. But for a long time, I ran away from the legacy. True. And I think that's disrespectful to everything that my mother and my father achieved. So it's become a balancing act. What age were you when you sort of like realized that? I don't think you do. I think it's when you grow up with it, you do, know it, but it's not like one day you wake up and in a cold sweat and go, oh my God. So it's a gradual process. Because they didn't want to raise, have me raised by nannies or this or absentee parents, you know, the whole family would pick up and go. But I was on the road with them from the time I was six months old. You're an author. Uh, your book, Lies My Mother Told Me, Tall Tales from a Short Woman. Um, Tell us about the idea of when you wanted to write the book and is there anything that we can share without you know, revealing too much? Oh, I can reveal all of it. I have no problem. Would you like me to do a reading? God, it started at the beginning of COVID and I have a wonderful writing partner and one of the great joys we both get is working together because we just laugh. And we decided, look, what's gonna be our next book? So it started out as an article because everyone kept saying to me, what would your mother think about what's going on? So then we said, well, let's rewrite the history of the world as if my mother was telling it. We were trying to figure out how to put Napoleon on Elba and there not being a Starbucks, being the real reason that he wanted to get off. And we got completely stuck. We couldn't make it work. And then we thought, well, what if we turned it into bad advice? And then that kind of became making up these grandiose stories as if these were stories my mother told me. And writing in my mother's voice gave us a lot of latitude. Sure. And we could go places that if I went just as me saying it, we would not be able to say it. 
And that's how it started. And we just took the idea and ran with it. And it's amazing to me because you look and we know how far we went writing it and that how much we had to pull back. But it was, it saved us. You talk a lot about lies, your, your mother telling lies and all that, and then... No, no. Truth adjacent. Truth adjacent. You know, when you were young, obviously she was feeding you information. Yes. When was it that you realized that the lies were... Not the real story? Not the real story, and she was doing it maybe for your own good in some, in some ways? I think every parent lies to their child out of desperation. I don't know if you're a parent yet, but everything is why, 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 why? And sometimes you just make something up to have them shut up. The lies that I tell in the book, the stories I tell in the book, were not things my mother actually said to me. Of course. And people keep asking me, is this a memoir? And I'm like, she was crazy, but not totally psychotic. And do you think it's just satire way of just um, distributing like humor? It is a complete satire, complete satire. And a lot of people are missing that. I mean, if I do one more interview where they're like, was this a memoir? I'm like, hell no. In our show, we, we try to inspire young people by telling stories. I have a quote here where you and your mom, you, you talk about everyone gets knocked down in life. It's what you do when you get up that matters. You always have to look forwards and not backwards, otherwise you'll trip and fall. Yes. Can you tell us uh, a bit about that kind of like um, how you live by that and what kind of examples and stories you can share with us. It really started sort of our family, you know, everyone's like, what's the family motto? And we, we lived by one of which is sort of a bastardized version of a Winston Churchill quote, which is, when you find yourself in hell, keep going. And that's just keep moving forward, moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. Learn from the past, move forward. And the other thing that we always said was, this too shall pass. And people are like, that's so depressing, but it's also a positive and it's more about being aware. Knowing that in the good times, recognize that they're good. Because this will pass and in the bad, knowing, chin up, move forward, this will pass too. You know, I look at my life and I look at, you know, my father's life and my mother's life and really my mother's about just keep getting up. And her other thing she always said, and people don't want to hear this, go through any door that opens because you don't know where it's going to take you. Everyone's like, well, it's not what I want to do or it isn't exactly what I was hoping for. You don't know where it's going to lead you and what you might end up loving that you might not know. Our joke was always someone would say, you know, we have an offer. And then we would say, how much? And then the second question is, what is it? Sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I can do that for that amount. Or any amount. Or any amount. So Melissa, Fashion Police, uh, you and your mom were a dynamic duo. How has it evolved and grown from when you guys did it to sort of like the programs that are, are on air right now? You can't do it anymore. It would, everyone's like, bring it back, bring it back. And the question is how? You can't, you can't say anything. And if you did, it would be like, well, she's a beautiful woman and of the strongest moral character and such a good person and body positive. I'm not sure that this is maybe the dress I would pick for her, but that's not saying that the designer is not a genius and that the designer's a really good human and let's look at the rest of the collection because that's staggeringly beautiful, but I'm just not sure I think that's the best work. That's not entertainment. That is, I would shoot myself trying to produce a show like so that. So we can't be controversial anymore? Can't laugh anymore. Just now, it's, it's starting to a little bit swing back, but everything has to be so qualified and Because softened. we're too politically correct? The thing for me, that is one of the most disturbing things about cancel culture is it's taken away the idea that people can grow and learn and change. So someone gets canceled for something they did at 22, 25, 28. I always think of Kevin Hart and having to not give up hosting the Oscars because of a joke that he made 10 or 15 years before, when by the way, it was okay to make those jokes. So you're saying 10 years later, he cannot have grown and changed and learned and evolved. I think there's something intrinsically wrong with that. And I find that one of the more disturbing pieces of it. I agree, I think people always deserve a second chance. It's not even a second chance. 
it's you're not the same person. Could you imagine being judged for every ridiculous thing you said and did at let's say 25? Even if it's just today, could you would be like, no, 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 no. I, I, I know that's a bad idea now. And it, so you're gonna get canceled for something when you did then. I, I, I really have such an issue with, especially with that part of it. No, I agree with you. I mean, you could be wrong 10 years ago, but as long as now you accept, acknowledge that the, the, whatever you said or did yes, 10 years ago yes. is wrong and you, we can all move on. Mental health is a very important subject, yes. um, especially in current times where people acknowledge that it actually exists. What are you doing uh, in terms of like philanthropic work? Well, I've been a big suicide prevention advocate since the age of 19, which is when my father killed himself. And especially then, nobody, God, that was like 88, really then people did not discuss it. And it was very shameful and you didn't talk about mental health and you were embarrassed if you went to a therapist. You know, I would say one of the worst things to ever happen in my life has become such an important and positive thing. And one of the upshots of COVID was mental health can now be openly spoken about. And there's acknowledgement and it's fascinating how many people now come out and say, oh, yeah, I'm really down, or I'm depressed, or this was awful. And it's so important. And so with, at Dee Dee Hirsch, where I'm on the board, we really push now on changing policy. Because insurance companies and state-funded Medi-Cal, Medicare, all over the country needs to acknowledge that mental health is just as important as physical health. And they are, we're finding out more and more how linked they are. And especially with this younger generation, the suicide rates of teens has gone through the roof and the most frightening is we're seeing a real surge in depression and suicide attempts from the groups five years old to eight years old. That's terrifying. Horrible. Talking of the, the younger generation, you talk about your son. Tell us a bit about how growing up in the Hollywood family um, and how you're teaching and raising your son in terms of values and principles. Um, I, I raised him very much like my parents raised me. This world has nothing to do with this world. I'm slightly ahead of the group that like you're not allowed to have expectations and everybody wins and you discuss things. And my son was raised much more like I was very traditionally. That there are expectations. That there are certain demands. There are certain behaviors that are unacceptable that you will get into trouble. One of the things I used to say to my son was when he was like a preteen and as a teen, he would start to make an excuse. I'm like, I am not that interested in your side of the story. And he would, blah, blah. I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> you can tell me when I want to hear it, but right now you're in trouble. I don't want to hear it was someone else's fault. And that's a very old school way of parenting that you really don't see anymore. And that's really what I did. I gave him the same moral, grounded foundation that I think my parents gave me. He had to get good grades. He had to be responsible. He had to be polite. He had to clear the table after dinner. I used to say to him, going to school is your job. Now, do you think you'd be fired from your job right now? Or would you be getting a raise? And I made that very clear that there's always responsibility. And I think that's one of the best lessons I could teach him. That's a great, great lesson. In terms of um, setback, what's been the biggest setback of your life? Well, the first one was losing my father. And people are like, was it losing my mother? No, that was an incredibly difficult situation. I think the biggest setback was ending Fashion Police that left me very much at odds. And I still have the mark on my ass from where the door slammed me on the way out, which was very distressing. So how long did it take and what did you do like post Fashion Police? I've written books, I've got a podcast, I've done a ton of philanthropy, I have a bunch of shows in production, I have two, a movie and a limited series in the scripted world, which is so completely new for me. And I took a, a beat to really 
get my son off to college and launched and happy and healthy. And I'm a cheap date. I take any job offered to me. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's the opening the door. Uh, yeah, theory. going through whatever door opens. Anything is possible, right? On the show, we always talk to a lot of guests. We always try to take negative stories and turn them into positive. It's very a big takeaway from you, which is you know when something not as good happens, at, at least in hindsight, you obviously took a lot of action by being productive. Yes. Would some advice for the younger viewers be what if something like bad happens, a negative experience? How 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 should one deal with such problems? As my mother used to say, what she would call a weekend wallow. You get to feel sorry for yourself for a couple days. And then you have to move forward. You know, energy, momentum creates energy, energy creates work. And you can take a week, you can take 10 days, hell, you can even take a month. But then get your shit together and start walking forward. It's back to Churchill. When you find yourself in hell, keep going. I watched a snippet somewhere on Instagram recently where, you know, this guru guy, and he says, um, you should only ponder upon something for five minutes. That's it. You shout, you scream, you do whatever, you, you, know, you reflect on that five minutes. After the five minutes, you don't react anymore. You have to move forward because every second or minute after that that you act negatively, you're wasting your own time. And there's no, nothing else you can change the fate of whatever the decision was. I'm glad my mother is no longer with us to hear that she potentially could have been a guru and written many self-help books on this topic. That would be very upsetting because it would have been a cash cow. <laughs> the opportunity might be yours now. <laughs> the opportunity might be mine. Yeah, I don't think after the last book anyone's gonna take anything <laughs> I say terribly seriously. I hear the voice going, God damn it, why didn't I think of that? Winning, succeeding, what does it take to have a winning mentality? Discipline. It's discipline. It's not letting yourself go down the rabbit hole. And by the way, I am the best at going down the rabbit hole. But I'm pretty darn good of getting myself out. It's really discipline. It's a, it's a muscle. So do you think it's more important to not go down the rabbit hole or to have the ability to get out of the rabbit hole? I think the ability to get out. I think you're putting too much pressure on yourself to not let yourself sometimes go there because that would be a whole mental health issue. See what's happening. As my mother said, take a weekend wallow, lay in bed for three days, deal with it, acknowledge it, process it, and then start climbing out. I actually also grew up in a very traditional Asian family where core values, manners, things like that are very important. So when you are teaching your son, or even yourself for that matter, what principles and ethics do you live by and, uh, and uphold. Be a good person. It's not that hard. I really truly believe, and this is going much deeper, you know, there's so many religions and there's so many different cultures, but there's a certain group of teachings that are universal. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments. I agree. Be a good person, don't steal, don't, you know, have sex with your neighbor's wife or their sheep. It's very basic and super clear. And I think that's really the universal sort of spiritual laws. Be a good person, be empathetic. But also I think you need to know when to walk away. I think part of having good morals is knowing when it's time for you to step in and also when it's time for you to step out and just let people be. And it's, it's hard. It's hard lessons, but I really do believe it all really comes down to, I hate to put it this way, but don't be a dick. It's the best advice we've actually had on the podcast. <laughs> the way is, uh, don't, don't be, be yeah. a dick. What's your biggest re regret? Oh God, there's so many. <laughs> some bad decisions I've made in my personal life. Those are definitely my biggest regrets. Are there some professional regrets? Absolutely. One of them being not necessarily appreciating different jobs I had when I had them, you know, and complaining and loving them, but still like, oh God, da, da, da. and also not stepping back and realizing how fantastic my situation was. It didn't mean I was being bitchy, but in hindsight, I'm like, I probably should have enjoyed it a little bit more. So the takeaway to the audience is what you mentioned earlier, which is each door, go through, go through them. Yeah. 
and make the best out of the situation and appreciate what you have. And remember, you can learn. You ne never stop learning. Never think that you know everything. You can be in any situation and look around and learn something. Sure, I agree with that. And anyone. And anyone. Do you believe in luck? I absolutely, I'd rather be lucky than talented. Luck over skill, any day. And how do you define success? And what do you go about doing it to achieve it? Pay your Amex bill. <laughs> and, you know, fight in the good fight. Never stop hustling. And during this hustle of life and grinding, what do you think is the single most important factor in success or in life? I think younger me would have been all outward facing public success, 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 success. As I'm growing older, I'm realizing that there's a lot of success in smaller things. Like I step back and look at my friend group and my closest friends are still the friends I made in college. Great. And I think that's a success that all these years later, they're the ones I pick up the phone and call. I look at my son doing well and achieving. And I look at that now as success. As I've grown up and gotten older and become, which I hate to say, an actual adult because it still sends shivers down my spine. Wiser. What? Wiser. Oh, hell, I'll never be wise. Just look at my personal life. It is just a shit show. We'll talk about that later. I look at success in smaller bites now. It's bite sizes, not necessarily the whole meal. Can you give us an example of something somewhere in life where you wanted to give up, but you just didn't? And what made you to come to that decision? What, what, what was the reason behind the perseverance? I really did want to give up after I left E. I thought everything was over. I was a mess. I didn't know what to do. And I could hear my mother's voice saying, how dare you? The greatest honor I can give my mother's legacy is the spirit of our family, which is we just don't give up. It's not who we are, it's not what we do. And I just had that conversation with my son the other day. Oh no, no, you don't get to give up. It's not who we are. I love that. That's uh, the whole epitome of the spirit of anything is possible. It's just keep going. Gotta keep going. Even yeah. if your heels hurt. Of course. Um, and I can tell you a lot of nights when I was hobbling home in high heels. Yeah. And what's the next big thing for Melissa? God, figuring out what I want to have for dinner tonight because all I've got is half a leftover salad. <laughs> Okay, tell us a, a bit about the, the new book. The new book, Lies My Mother Told Me, Tall Tales from a, short, from a Short Woman, not a memoir. It's a fun, easy Mother's Day gift, summer read. You can pick it up, you can put it down. It's what they used to call bathroom books. And you can, they're little short stories. And just allow yourself to laugh. Melissa, on Anything is Possible, we try to inspire young people. Our last question is always, please share with us your number one advice to our audience, especially our younger viewers. I guess it is that anything is possible and live that by never giving up. Melissa, thank you for, for thank your you. time and I really enjoyed our time together. Thank you. Thank you.